Welcome everybody. My name is Sena Stauffer and I'm a member of the steering committee of the Young Network of the German Council on Foreign Relations. Tonight's virtual event is titled From Utoya to Halle, Hanau and Christchurch, How to Combat the Globalization of Far-Right Extremism. This event is part of our speaking series that we initiated together with Diplomats of Color under the overarching theme, Rethinking Foreign Policy. We are looking forward to a lively discussion with our experts on what can be done at international and multilateral level to counter the threat of right-wing extremism. Without further ado, I want to introduce tonight's moderator, Dr. Hans Jakob Schindler, Senior Director at the Counter Extremism Project in New York and co chair of the advisory board of the Global Diplomatic Forum. He was a coordinator at the United Nations Security Council and prior to that worked in the private sector and for the federal government. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for the very kind uh, introduction. I really appreciate it. And I'm honored, of course, to moderate today's event. As already outlined in the last few years, uh, the growing transnational connectivity of the violent, right wing extremist and terrorist stakeholders has gained the attention both of the public as well as policymakers. It's wonderful to see that the diplomats of color and the young DGAP have taken on this issue for one of their meetings. As many may be aware, and this is the reason primarily why I'm here, my organization, the Counter Extremism Project, CEP, has published the first ever report on this connectivity between networks in Europe and the US at the end of last year, commissioned by the Federal Foreign Office. And I'm delighted that one of our primary cooperation partners, Mr. Hessen, is part of today's event. We are a transatlantic privately funded think tank and advocacy organization that works on a wide range of violent extremist and terrorist phenomena and work with the Federal Foreign Office through our office in Berlin. If you're interested in the report and the other stuff that we do and if you haven't seen it yet, maybe you can find it and a range of follow up reports and policy papers on this subject on our website. I'm glad that this event takes the conversation that started in earnest last year on the multilateral level forward and I'm honored to introduce the keynote speaker of today. Dr. Heather Ashby is currently a senior program officer at the United States Institute for Peace and has been named one of the top 35 black, national, uh, uh, black American national security and foreign policy next generation leaders by New America in 2018. Heather Ashby is a foreign policy and security professional based in Washington, D.C. In 2014, she received her PhD in Russian and global history from the University of Southern California. After graduate school, she worked on domestic and international security issues at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and the Federal Emergency Agency, FEMA, as well as in the private sector. Dr. Ashby, it really is a pleasure and an honor to have you with us today, and I'm very much looking forward to your remarks. The screen is all yours. Thank you so much. Uh, it's quite an honor and a pleasure to be here today with this distinguished panel and for the organizations who are sponsoring this event. I couldn't be more excited to talk about this issue because I feel it's so understudied, at least in the fields that I was in, particularly Department of Homeland Security and what we were looking at. Uh, and so I just want to touch a bit on the article I wrote for foreign policy and some other ideas that have come to me since that time period in early January. So that article on foreign policy that was looking at the linkages uh, and rise of far right extremism, particularly uh, through the 2000s with the emphasis on the 2010s, uh, was influenced by the events on January 6th uh, and the attack on the US Capitol in the United States. And so I thought it was opportune time to try to sit down and put all the pieces together to see how we got from what's viewed as isolated incidents to governments being more uh, far right and extremists to what took place at the Capitol. I was also influenced by my work at the Department of Homeland Security under the Obama administration and then transitioning under the Trump administration and noticing the distinctions in terms of what that focus was on extremism. Even though the Obama administration had heavy emphasis on Islamist extremists, there were still uh, discussions about far right outside of uh, Islamist extremism, but during my time under the Trump administration, that completely was going by the wayside. 
And then also I was influenced uh, in thinking back on the 2016 campaign and all the efforts by mainstream media in the United States to try to understand where support for Trump was coming from and the way that they were allowing a lot of these far right extremist ideas to be on their networks that helped to inadvertently spread it to people and sort of give credence to many of those ideas. And then uh, lastly, what influenced me was just my work as a historian. Uh, even though my research focused on the 1920s and 30s, uh, and the flow and circulation of ideas and social movements between Russia and other parts of the what would become the global south. I was also influenced by studying anti colonial movement colonialism and the legacy of those movements for equality that moved across borders. And so all that was factored into my thinking and writing the article. And so some of the causes I see for this growing rise that took place during the 2000s uh, prominently is the global war on terror, which we're coming to a point of reevaluating with the recent pullout of Afghanistan, as well as discussion of the 20 years since the 9-11 attacks in New York City, and just the growing distrust that became more mainstream of Muslims and people who were perceived as Muslims and how that started to become more mainstream and okay to express those ideas within the mainstream media as well as for politicians. And then within that context of the global war on terror in which everything is just black and white and one side has to win, is just the series of being under constant threat. And so this fear building up in the population that they are under threat and they need to fight back. And if the government isn't doing it, people will take it in their own hands to fight against people uh, of different skin colors, religions, who are perceived as threats to the system that the government isn't taking care of. And then I think another aspect within that global war on terror was just the connections and enable between countries to fight this. So then you have this rhetoric uh, moving across borders about trying to fight terrorism that was sort of seeping into the population as well in efforts to mobilize individuals and communities to support this war effort of different governments across the world. Another aspect I see that was causing this wave emerging in the 2000s was the financial crisis and just a lot of the anxiety that produced and questions about what is government for, who it represents, and what is it doing. And so that leads people to take their own initiative in terms of how they're going to combat what threats they see if they don't believe the government is there for them to support them and follow in along with these extremist ideas. And then the other aspect which is receiving a lot of attention, uh, particularly after the 2016 campaign in the United States is social media and the role that social media plays to spread ideas. And the, as a historian, the idea of idea spreading isn't new to me because if you go back historically, you see a lot of the far right extremist ideas reach back to historical places that were spread in ideas during the 1960s and 70s, like this uh, South African apartheid as a way to mobilize communities. There's also the state of Rhodesia and the return to Rhodesia uh, that pops up a lot currently within far-right groups, merchandise is being sold. Uh, you had Dylan Roof who killed uh, Black parishioners in South Carolina who had, who was writing about Rhodesia and this return to that. So this mythical past, that's such a critical aspect of that. And look at the historical antecedents that continue to pop up. And so I always say history matters. It may not be exactly the same, but it definitely rhymes as the saying goes. And so in thinking about all of that and so much taking place, I know it could be challenging. It just seems overwhelming. And so for me, I think there's still steps that could be taken to address this. Uh, so everyone doesn't throw up their hands and just say the world is gone, especially with fears about climate change and other threats that are impacting the world. Uh, for me, I think it's so critical to re-engage multilateral forums to address this threat and its transnational aspects. There are various groupings of countries that could play a critical role. One is the Global Counterterrorism Forum, which was originally created to focus on Islamist extremists. Um, but that could also be, since they have done so much work, could be part of the foundation to address in far-right extremism. The other aspect is the Five Eyes Alliance, 
And what people may not know is that it started off as an intelligence alliance. You have the defense cooperation, but behind that, and what I learned at the Department of Homeland Security is there's a law enforcement cooperation behind that. And so that could be a suitable forum for bringing the equivalent of attorney generals, Department of Justice and law enforcement agencies together to address this threat, share information about how people are moving across borders and exchanging ideas. The other is the uh, Christchurch call that served as a forum for bringing countries together with social media companies. And if there's any hope to address the challenges of ideas spreading on social media, it will be to talk to social media companies and start developing more standards that could cross borders uh, and avoid some of these ideas flowing so freely. And I appreciate what uh, France and New Zealand started with that effort and hope more countries join and that social media companies continue to play an active role and take it seriously. I think one of the challenges with social media companies is it's so uneven in terms of enforcement across borders. And so that's a forum in which you could discuss how to approach that. Because depending on the resources of a country, you could bring Mark Zuckerberg to the table to testify, but that may not happen in other countries uh, to bring social media leaders to the table to say, hey, you're messing up here. What are you going to do? Uh, another aspect is just to work with more law enforcement, military, and politicians who have connections to far-right groups and to have that acknowledged. I know this is something uh, within the U.S. that has historical antecedents uh, that go back to the 1950s and 1960s during the same time that you had the emergence of the civil rights movement. And so that's always been a problem within the United States. And so that's a challenge that has to continually be addressed uh, and then it's also the challenge that for a number of communities of color in the United States, that's tied to state violence, tied to those law enforcement groups who have those far right ties. And so it's a delicate balance of when you're offering critiques of state violence, you're also offering critiques of law enforcement and practices. And it's so hard for the state to operate and respond in a way that's effective to uh, different communities. And then one final thing is based on my current work focusing on Russia issues uh, cross borders uh, in Europe, Asia, Africa, and Latin America is to watch out for Russia's support for far right groups. There's been some write-in on this, but it hasn't gained too much traction in terms of the broader discussion about the threats that Russia poses to uh, European countries to the United States. And so that needs to be taken seriously in terms of tracking how money is flowing, training, expertise is moving, uh, because that's going to be another aspect to how things are coming together for far right groups. And so uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Hans, and I want to thank everyone again for uh, inviting me and just listening. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. This was a wonderful start of the event and, of course, a great introduction um, to today's panel discussion, also by outlining not only the root causes and events that really brought us to this situation and the technologies that enable and accelerate these developments, but also to give initial ideas of what fora on the multinational level this could be used. Obviously, looking from a German perspective, um, the Five Eyes is an interesting format, but unfortunately, Germany has no eyes in the Five Eyes. So we would need to think beyond beyond the Five Eyes initiative. Um, obviously, uh, Christchurch call is, is a very important for us as well. But um, now looking at our panel, um, let me have about a couple of minutes just to introduce who is actually on the panel before we start with the discussion. Um, and I'm starting with uh, Dr. Anna Meyer. Uh, Dr. Anna Meyer is an assistant professor of politics and international relations at the University of Nottingham. She holds a PhD in political science from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Prior to her current position, she worked at the START Consortium, which I think is very relevant, at the University of Maryland, primarily on the counterterrorism database and at the Project on Government Oversight in Washington, DC. Her research focuses currently on institutional responses to white supremacist violence in Europe and the United States, so a very relevant topic for today's discussion, using ethnographic methods to examine how those who make and enforce counterterrorism, counter extremism policy, understand the threat. She has published in numerous academic journals and media outlets and has served as an expert consultant for Tech Against Terrorism, which is the smaller brother of GIFCT, so the small platform advisory body that the Security Council set up, and 
Rand Europe. Uh, Dr. Meyer, welcome to today's event. Our second panelist is Farah Kasim. Farah Kasim is a political affairs officer at the United Nations Counterterrorism Committee Executive Directorate, CTET, working in the political analysis and research unit for the past five years, examining terrorism and counterterrorism trends, issues, and the development around the world. Prior to CTET, Farah worked on women's rights, human rights, and refugee issues in the Middle East and North Africa for international NGOs and the United Nations. She holds a master's degree in human rights from the University of Sussex. As you may all be aware, CTED, in cooperation with its global research network that uh, Farah uh, helps to lead, has published uh, trends alerts or publishes trends alerts for quite a while. But uh, since April 2020, several ones that actually focus on the threat emanate emanating from the right-wing extremism and terrorism, and therefore facilitated the first rounds of discussion at the United Nations, in particular also among Security Council members. And these reports, of course, can also be found on the CTED website. Uh, Ms. Kazim, it's a pleasure to have you with us today, and I'm very much looking forward to your contribution. Finally, last but definitely not least, it's my pleasure extremism and terrorism since last year. Mr. Herrchen is currently the Deputy Head of Division International Cooperation Against Terrorism, Drug Trafficking and Organized Crime of the Federal Foreign Office in Berlin, the section that commissioned the report that I already mentioned. He joined the Federal Foreign Office in 2008 and before this, uh, before his current position was the Deputy Chief of Mission at the German Embassy in Bamako until 2019. From 2015 to 18, he served as the acting head of the political section of the German delegation to NATO in Brussels after working as a member of the policy planning staff at the Federal Foreign Office in Berlin between 2012 and 15. And lastly, from 2009 to 12, he was posted at the German embassy in Caracas, Venezuela. So quite an eminent uh, array of uh, panelists. And um, I'm very much looking forward to, to the discussion. And I wanted to start off, um, of course, with my good old friend, uh, Mr. Hagen, because he has the greatest tolerance level for me to getting on his nerves um, among the panelists to look at the approach that the or uh, 05, uh, so the section that your deputy head of and the foreign ministry has taken to look at the multilateral level. Um, what, what, where do you see the greatest challenges here and the greatest opportunities? Thank you very much, uh, uh, Hans-Jakob Schindler, for, for the kind introduction. Thank you very much, Heather Ashby, for this great uh, uh, keynote and, and the, the thoughts uh, and also uh, suggestions you already provided. From our perspective, which is a foreign policy uh, one, um, we see the main challenges in awareness raising, changing policy, and adapting capacity building efforts. So these are the three axes along which we try to operate and try to target this topic. Uh, the awareness raising, the study we commissioned with you was the initial step because ourselves, we found, okay, we had all these events that were that were mentioned, that are mentioned in the title, and we had the first signs of transnational connectivity when it comes to narratives, when it comes to communication. But beyond that, to make it a foreign policy issue, the linkages are the main challenge here for us to see, to further develop our knowledge, to increase our analysis. Um, on the policy level, uh, we were able to, to incorporate the topic already in, in several areas, be it in the EU uh, council, uh, council conclusions in the summer of 2020, where it appears for the first time. And when we had the council presidency, we continued on the topic. And, uh, we were able to incorporate it into the, the UN uh, Global Counterterrorism Strategy Review for the first time. So there are some topics, the OSCE, the FATF, when it comes to terrorist financing, institutions have picked it up. But to get to the next level, there are, from my point of view, three areas where we should and could look further into. One is the financing aspect. If we really want to, to tackle the issue, uh, curbing uh, the financing of terrorism is, is one of the most effective uh, issues, uh, um, is one of uh, where we can gain multilateral support, where we can actually design joint actions. Um, however, if we look at uh, uh, the attacks which were mentioned uh, uh, in, the, in the title or in the introduction, those were all lone actors 
who, who funded the, the attacks uh, out of their own pocket. But at the same time, at least from the German uh, um, experience, we know about areas of funding of the violent right-wing extremists when it comes to um, sports event, music events, uh, martial arts, um, 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 so, so there are, and then we have linkages actually to uh, possible linkages to organized crime when it comes to trafficking of drugs, methamphetamines uh, uh, linked to the sports and mixed martial arts. So this kind of knowledge from a national level has to be shared and brought to the attention of others in order to jointly develop a mapping of possible financing uh, which is there. We are very glad that the, the FATF, uh, the Financial Action Task Force, which is currently also under German presidency, has started work on this. Um, and they actually uh, decided to adapt their indicators. That is a very technical and very small step. But from our point of view, it's very practical. And so everybody has to now check boxes in their evaluation uh, that they have also looked at this area, which is, which is something. Second area is training activities. We know about uh, 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 actors going from one to another country um, uh, uh, and acquire weapons training, etc. But this, in comparison to the past, again, uh, um, a characteristic of this new uh, movement and, and how they uh, develop and how they act, these are all legal shooting ranges. This is not the 70s, 80s with uh, uh, training camps of the Red Army Fraction somewhere in the Jordanian desert we, we all know was illegal. This is different. Uh, um, so we, but at, again, it's awareness raising, is sharing information uh, between nations, that there is a movement, that there is training, and that those people have to be watched uh, in the follow-up. Um, and the third challenge is, is rather an organizational or a practical one, which is terminology, definitions, and data. Um, I mean, I, I'm not going into detail about my multilateral debates and discussions on terminology, which is, you know, that's, that's something. Um, if you look at the GCTS review that I just mentioned, uh, you now have a sort of long line of adjectives um, because uh, we couldn't agree on the terminology in some areas. But again, this is not because we, we, we are stubborn, uh, uh, but because there's different history behind certain uh, uh, words. Um, and when it comes to extremism, categorizing it in left and right, that is something from our German perspective is very easy because we've done so in the past and it's, it's easy for us to categorize. If you approach other countries already, the term extremism is, is far away from, from the terrorist threat. So you have to be clear about violent extremism. You don't want to move into political populism. Um, um, and, and you also have to be aware that the countermeasures uh, are, are much different depending on these kind of, of words. But if you don't have a common denominator, you don't have data that you can share. And so that is something we try to move ahead um, in, in order to also design capacity building uh, um, programs together with UNODC, with the OSCE. Both organizations have started to work on the topic as well to provide workshops, seminars to law enforcement uh, practitioners in order to address uh, the challenge of, of violent right-wing extremism. So those are the three topics. Sorry for already going a little bit into detail, but I think there has been some stuff already going on, but we, we continue to, to uh, face difficulties here on, on, on different levels, uh, which we have to take into consideration to continue our, our joint efforts. Fantastic. Great start to the panel discussion. Before we move on uh, um, with the discussion, something I... Um, stupidly forgot to mention. So this is, of course, supposed to be an interactive part of the event. So if you have any questions, dear participants, I suggest please go down with the cursor to your toolbar. There is a little window called chat. Click on this, post your question there. It would help me and the panelists very much. Um, if you could please, um, in your question, uh, indicate which panel or panelists um, you would like to uh, address the question to. So that'd be very helpful. I'll keep monitoring that window and then we'll post your questions 
um, to the panelists uh, so that it's also useful for you, not just for us. Um, and and uh, Dr. Ashby decided to thank you to stay with us during the event. So if there's any questions concerning her opening remarks, please also feel free to do so. Um, Dr. Meyer, we, we just, uh, and then uh, Mr. Hashin gave me the perfect segue to your work, um, talking about uh, terminal. Hans, I lost your, can't hear you. Common un Pardon me, uh, it, it, there's a growing common understanding of um, terminology on the opposite side. So, you know, if you say day X, if you say um, white power or white genocide or great replacement, everyone from Australia to North America to Europe seems to understand within the milieu exactly what you mean and what the reaction to, to this kind of de perceived development should be. However, we on the opposite side, trying to mitigate the threat, seem to be struggling with terminology. So where do you see ways out off ramps to come from the definition debate to an actual operational level? So where, where is the problem with the understanding? Mr. Ashton already mentioned some historical background, but maybe you could uh, uh, enlighten us a little bit further. Certainly. Um, so thank you, first of all, uh, for having me. This is a fantastic discussion, and I'm glad to be here. Uh, on the issue of terminology uh, and how we think about what we're calling the violence that we're discussing here and the groups that are surrounding this violence, um, you'll notice that in my description that I sent to you of my work, I used the phrase white supremacist violence, and I did that intentionally, um, as opposed to far-right extremism um, or far-right terrorism, what have you. I think it's because um, what's critical here to really getting at the roots of what we're talking about is naming the ideology that is underlying and driving a lot of this activism and a lot of the violence that comes out of it. Um, and that can become very uncomfortable. Uh, I'll quote from a German parliamentary staffer whom I spoke with in 2019, um, who said, the problem isn't the violence, the problem is the ideology. And what do you do with that in a democratic setting? Um, and so where I think the terminology becomes very complicated is because white supremacy as sort of a system of racial relations, determining how we order groups in society and who quote unquote should be on top with these violent organizations then take up and use a justification for their actions. Um, that that basic idea is in many cases uncomfortably close to the mainstream. Um, in my work with diplomats uh, and staffers in the United States, um, they tell me quite frankly that there is privately a lot of political will for doing something more, whatever that might be, about far-right extremism uh, and white supremacist violence, but it's just a political non-starter and cannot be spoken about publicly um, because doing so might implicate um, more mainstream members of the Republican Party. Um, and so when you have an ideology that is driving violence, that is in some ways implicated in existing institutions, that is hegemonic and more closely related to how societies are actually ordered. And when we're here, when I'm speaking generally about global north, what you might call Western uh, societies, then it becomes very complicated to name that underlying ideology. Um, and so I think that if we are actually serious about policy responses to the global far right, to white supremacist violence, then we need to name white supremacy as part of that. I consider where our white supremacist ideology is located not only in non-state actors um, in, in foreign governments that might be supporting these non-state actors, but also uncomfortably in some of our own institutions. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. It was quite clear. And as you said, uh, maybe an uncomfortable realization. I mean, just to point out in, in Germany, we did have a revolving series of scandals. Um, um, at the core of this was um, a certain affiliation with some members of the security forces with, with these kind of ideas. So, you know, uh, unfortunately, in Germany, we seem to be ahead of, of the curve on, on this one a little bit. Um, Farah, um, you luckily work for, for CTED, which is, you know, primarily targeted towards the Security Council, so you only have 15 cuts to herd other, by, other than 193 if you would be at the General Assembly, but still, you do have a broad range of regions, of course, all regions uh, represented in the Security Council, which means regions like Africa, where 
you know, for many countries, the question really is, so what has that got to do with me? Um, if you're talking about white supremacists or right-wing extremism. So how is your experience on trying to push the issue on the global agenda in the Security Council? What are the challenges that you encountered and what, what are you know, the advice that you would give um, for, for diplomats that are working on this issue now and trying to see what multilateral fora would be best to pursue this? Thank you, and, and, and thanks for, for inviting me to this really great conversation. Um, I think that's a really great question in that actually you'd be very surprised how few countries um, objected to us discussing the topic. It did take quite some time. I've been with, with CTED for about five years, and we initiated conversations behind closed doors with the CTC members quite some time ago, it took a little bit of massaging and maneuvering to get the conversation going and to really get some member states on board. Um, there was a lot of hesitancy, even when we published our first uh, report back, uh, our trends alert back in April. Um, and then, uh, but then that was received well. And so then we did a follow up one in July, which covered kind of the conspiracy theories and everything um, that were conflated, especially with the COVID 19 pandemic. Um, so, the reality was we had actually heard from some member states uh, in Africa and Asia about how some of these issues are touching on their own territories, that there is kind of transnational uh, linkages that um, are affecting their own lives. Um, South Africa was one country, for example, that also highlighted because that is a very different context in Africa as well but due to um, kind of the, the apartheid history and everything there but they also highlighted the fact that white supremacy and, and terrorism from the far right is is a problem. I think additionally there were um, on a broader conversation a lot of other countries especially those with, with Muslim populations who have been stigmatized by terrorism saw this as an opportunity to say, really, you know, when the UN Security Council resolutions say terrorism in all its forms and manifestations, it is terrorism in all of its forms and manifestations, and it shouldn't, there should be no distinction between um, groups affiliated with ISIL and Al-Qaeda, for example, versus white supremacist uh, extreme right-wing groups. So um, on the Security Council level, it did take a lot of kind of sensitization to get to the point where we are at right now. Um, there is still a lot of work ahead of us and we're trying to figure out the next steps that would be beneficial because now that we've, we've flagged the issue, we say, okay, member states are saying this is a problem. What's the next step? So this is where we are in the process. We have a couple of things in the pipeline that unfortunately I can't share at the moment, but hopefully in 2022, you'll be able to see some new um, thoughts and how to take issues from kind of, from just, saying okay this is a problem to okay here are some actual ways that we can address this um yeah and i think as simon you know mentioned the gcts process also is an indicator that member states are really on board now at the at the un level and um you know it is quite a long statement but it's if, if you let me quote it it is called terrorism on the basis of xenophobia racism and other forms of intolerance or in the name of religion or belief. So it's quite a, a mouthful, um, but it is a, quite a significant step in the fact that 193 member states see this as an issue of concern and that it should be considered in, in the UN counterterrorism strategy. Fantastic, thank you for this uh, initial overview. I really appreciate this. Um, Mr. Ashton, <coughs> there's already a question from one of the participants directly related to what you said. Um, and, and it comes to a definition again, of course, a terminology thing. You said the perpetrators of the Utoya, Kowe and other attacks were all known actors as far as the financing is concerned, which is obviously um, the case. But do you think the um, participant asked that they were in their radicalization also known actors? Um, that is, it's it's a very good question, but it's all because it's also oftentimes uh, from our perspective um, um, a misrepresentation of the uh, radicalization process. If you uh, 
stigmatize or sort of view the lone wolf in being at home. No radicalization happens in a vacuum. So we already heard about all the, the, the new narratives uh, that uh, sort of this, this, this new trend of, of transnational uh, uh, violent right-wing extremism is talking about, which has been, uh, if you look into uh, uh, the manifest by Anders Breivik, if you look into the copying that was done in Christchurch by, by Brenton Tart, and then it goes on and those things have been requoted, requoted. The, it's always the same books, it's the same trends, it's the same stories which are now being shared, which are different to how the purely national right-wing movements have identified and, and, and had uh, uh, sort of the, the ideological core they had in the past. So this is this one. This is one surrounding, and the other one is very much what what I would agree. What Heather mentioned in the beginning, there has been a lot of changes within societies. Um, in 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 Germany, very much uh, the the response to um, the migration, the so-called uh, migration crisis from 2015, was a culminating issue for many of these groups, and how this was dealt with in the public in social media or not being dealt with uh, uh, in the political arena has of course led to a surrounding in which then a radicalization process takes place. So it's, it's, it happens at home, it's no longer as part of a larger group with a charismatic leader which meets every Thursday, you know, th this, this time this is no longer happening. But we have the transnational narratives and we have national, local, specific environment, which can be different from country to country, uh, but which leads to a radicalization process, uh, which then can happen because of the overall shift and increasingly so throughout the pandemic from offline to online. So the availability of material, the availability of echo chambers, of uh, uh, instruments and content uh, uh, will then um, be sort of the, the, the factors surrounding a radicalization process. Super, thank you so much. Since we are on the, I mean, we've now first discussed the structural framework and we realized in our days, not only awareness raising going on, but also take up of, of the issue at the FETF, at the OSCE, at the UN ODC. But when we talk about online, we do really have two challenges here. Number one is obviously a still rather undeveloped regulatory framework and the EU, you know, as, as many may be aware of you, uh, of you may be aware, is, is trying to catch up with this. They just passed the, the terrorist content online regulation but they're also negotiating now the Digital Services Act, which is really the first attempt to regulate this industry similar to regulations in the other industry, but rather less strict so far. However, we also have the problem that we need to normally be able to tell uh, social media companies who the bad actors are, but we don't have lists of similar to the Al-Qaeda or Taliban sanctions list or the EU terror list of any of these groups. So, Let's move on to the discussion of how we have to balance industry um, responsibility for the security of their services versus uh, the legitimate demand that violent actors should not be on the list by ideally, hopefully preventing weird cons uh, constellations where, you know, former President Trump is banned from Twitter, but the Taliban are on and most of the right wing extremist dangerous actors are still on Twitter. So how can we balance this? Um, uh, Heather, you, you from a US perspective, certainly have seen the discussion that's going on uh, now in US Congress um, with regulating the malign amplification of, of dangerous material. But what, what, how do you see the Biden administration moving here? Is Congress ahead of the administration or is uh, Congress, um, in your opinion, catching up with the administration here? Yeah, I think the administration is still trying to get its legs underneath it because of so many things going on right now that I think Congress ends up taking the lead based on the preference of members and their ability to mobilize others for it. 
I think some of the challenges that encounter any type of regulation and discussion on this issue is the perception by some uh, members of a political party that social media is against them. And so if you look to stop certain forms of speech, then it's considered an attack on another <laughs> political party. And so there's gonna be a lot of negotiations going on in terms of how to balance it. And then for the Biden administration, once they sort of uh, address a few other issues, they're going to look more deeply into this from the White House perspective and mobilize in the U.S. government to see what can be done under their broader cybersecurity, cyber work to have these discussions in the same time it's overlapping with national security and perceptions about threats. Fantastic. Um, Farah, I know that CTED is also very heavily involved in tech against terrorism. As I said, it's the small brother or sister of, of GIFT CT. Um, but where do you see the way forward here? I mean, obviously we had um, ample um, declarations of support from the industry for these events and uh, um, prostrations of actual greater involvement and greater resources being spent, but we... I'm sorry, Hansi. Taking on this seriously. You cut out you can... a bit towards the end. Ah, I said, I, we, we continue to see large scale failures of platforms to actually you know, take on this issue, whether it's right wing extremism or Islamist terrorism in a strategic manner. It seems to be still whack a mole reputational management problems that they're solving rather than a concerned strategic approach to this. Yeah, and it's. Uh, I mean, it's quite tricky. And also you have you have the larger platforms who are to some extent working on addressing some of these things, but also more work needs to be done. But at the same time, I think we need to consider or bear in mind smaller platforms that maybe don't have uh, the human resources, the financial resources um, and the capabilities, the trainings to detect and address um, terrorist content, be it from the extreme right or, or um, from groups like Al-Qaeda or ISIS. Um, I, think, I think it is important to note that, you know, uh, member states and, and, and the private sector and the United Nations are, are working to try to address this. I think there are several challenges and major complications. And you, for some, it is having a definition, although for the UN, we have managed to work on counterterrorism issues without necessarily having a universal definition of terrorism. Um, I don't say this is good or bad, um, but we have managed to work around that definitional issue by identifying, for example, um, um, what is a terrorist act, and therefore that is kind of will help you understand how better to look at it. So with the private sector, um, and particularly uh, tech companies, I think there still is quite a way to go and, and there may have to be some kind of creative thinking and how to address some of these issues. I mean, we, it's great to have platforms such as GCTF, Tech Against Terrorism that are supporting, but there's still a lot to be done. And as, particularly with extreme right-wing groups uh, who use a lot of gaming platforms to get their messages across to, to um, uh, to recruit, to use, to spread propaganda. It is in different kinds of platforms than what people would normally consider uh, a tech platform that, you know, you would automatically assume Facebook or, or Twitter. So there are other um, channels that need to be considered in this um, and a significant amount of work that needs to be done. I don't think I have an answer to any of this, but it is definitely something that um, policy members, um, need to work, I believe, with the private sector, yes, the tech companies who are undergoing some of these things, but there is a lot of research being done in this area, in this field, and so it's really important for, I, I believe, policymakers and researchers to really link that information, to have evidence-based policy to move this forward and move it in the right direction. I think a lot of lessons have been learned from um, the past 20 years of counterterrorism that we can probably take forward, and especially with ISIL on the tech platform. So a lot of this can be um, tailored to this threat that's emanating from the extreme right on, in online platforms. Fantastic, well, thank you so much. I mean, obviously 
Um, I want to shamelessly plug an event that uh, CP is doing in two days. We are just about to publish a report on what right wing extreme violent right wing extreme is doing on major platforms still to a little bit counter balance the prevailing narrative that they all moved on to smaller platforms and um, not to take that event off uh, uh, the main message. It's tomorrow. It's a Wednesday morning uh, German time for German speakers. Um, of, course, of course, they're still on the major platforms and they're doing what Mr. Hashin said. They're financing their activities by running their shops, by doing advertisement, by trying to normalize their ideology by being the friendly Nazi of the neighborhood rather than the one with the baseball bat. So, I mean, major platforms still have a major role to play. Uh, and obviously, um, given the whistleblowers revelations of the last couple of weeks, um, a, a, a rather big corn of salt is necessary to take their uh, um, assurances that they are taking these issues uh, very seriously um, is, I think, in order here. Um, I think they know more than they let on, and they do less as they could. Um, but we have a question about education, um, which somehow ties in. I'm trying to, to bring the different threads together here um, with what we've just been discussing. And I thought uh, Dr. Maya may, may have an interesting view on this one. Uh, the participant says, you know, I've, he's been looking at right-wing extremism in Germany for a long time. Um, he's been struck by the fact that a lot of young adults don't necessarily only get their right-wing ideology from their um, from uh, social media, but also from their parental surroundings, um, which ties in quite nicely with a study that the University of Munich did a couple of years ago, looking at the prevailing um, right-wing extremist voting patterns between 2016 and 1932 and 33, and found a near 90% overlap between voting patterns uh, in the last uh, um, democratic election and then in the 2016 election all over Germany, uh, so demonstrating that it's not necessarily East-West German uh, um, problem, but maybe a underlying trend that is really deeply entrained in society. So how would you do address the issue via education, uh, um, Ms. Meyer? Oh, that is a hard question, um, but a really important one. And I don't want to speak too far outside of my area of expertise, uh, so I would direct the participant towards the work of Dr. Cynthia Miller Idris, um, who's done some really excellent work on youth radicalization uh, in the far right in both Germany and the US. Um, what I will say is that this issue of education, whether through the formal schooling system or uh, at home uh, with parental figures with family. Um, gets that sort of this broader whole of society approach that I think we need to take when we're thinking about white supremacist violence, far right extremism. Um, thinking about how we discuss these concepts culturally, how we introduce them um, very early on in education, and how we think about these in connection to remembrance of historical events, um, discussion of politics more generally. Um, and so that is perhaps a very vague answer, um, which I admit readily. Um, but um, I think getting at this broader question of, which I think is, is hinting at, um, there are so many avenues through which people might be exposed to far right extremist ideas. How do you tackle all of those potentially, um, especially when they're in less formal settings like in the home? And I think those are larger societal conversations that have to be had um, through larger discussions of, say, transitional justice and restorative justice and education, um, and less so from a security framework. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Ashen. One of the questions that was posed in the actual advertisement of the event is how can the fight against right-wing extremism be in integrated into foreign policy? Now, looking at the multilateral fora that you mentioned, they're usually security-oriented fora, OSCE, FATF, but looking at what, for example, the German embassy could do uh, in a cultural section uh, um, policy, what would be, what is the strategy of the of the foreign ministry that they've, and I know that they've started thinking about this, especially with the diplomats of color and other agencies. Um, how can you integrate this into the work of foreign cultural policy? Well, thank you for that question. And I think it's been part, in, in a, a specific part has already been part of our, our work uh, for quite a while. And that is of course, uh, uh, fighting uh, anti-Semitism which has been a topic 
for our uh, cultural and public diplomacy uh, uh, since uh, um, since we started as a ministry. Um, so this is um, already part in what kind of topics uh, are you presenting? Who do you work with on the ground? I remember in my first posting, uh, we supported uh, uh, the Jewish Film Festival in Caracas. You know, that's uh, uh, the traditionally one, one of those issues, but that's not the strategic way that we have to approach it nowadays when we talk about this issue. But this also comes back to the question of who's, who's actually involved in the topic. Uh, and, and Farah mentioned this when, when we had the GCTS uh, uh, discussion, um, this is still perceived very much as a European uh, North American problem. So th the whole question when, when you sometimes, okay, you have Australia and New Zealand is uh, also there, but it's still being very much perceived as this is only happening in some specific countries. And even others still do not have the awareness that uh, uh, this is actually a bigger trend with a growing threat so uh, uh, the communication part of what we are doing, again, usually you know, we, we don't go around, tell people what they have to do. So, so talking about what we have been doing, how we are confronting the issue is, is of course uh, uh, the first step on how to communicate and make this part of, of public diplomacy in, in the best way and thereby engage uh, a host country, a host government, a host civil society uh, in order to, to share views, share experiences, which is also linked to the previous question you asked on, on the practices of, of education. Um, again, the German uh, experiences, we started very much in the preventive national work on the right-wing spectrum in the 80s and 90s. All the first programs that were initiated, and this is now talking out of my uh, field of expertise, but it's within our interior ministry and uh, in the family uh, uh, ministry but uh, uh, that's where it started it then shifted to uh, uh, to radical islamism and now it's shifting back so we have experience how exit programs can be done how prevention can be done what a bundeszentrale for political bildung so educational programs can do in countering extremism um, and we have already, for example, set up a European network, the Radicalization Awareness Network, where practitioners, think tanks, academians come together and share their experience. So this can be where it is, it is welcomed, be shared uh, uh, through public diplomacy, uh, through pro programs uh, and, and, and through uh, you know, workshops and sharing best practices. But again, if, if the awareness is not there, that this is, you know, a, this is really a specific topic uh, where, where something is happening uh, beyond uh, uh, sort of hooliganism, as, as some countries still refer to it, uh, then we have difficulties um, to approach, to share, and sometimes then the cultural activities might actually be the, the, the foot in the door where we can attract uh, attention and, and uh, communicate issues without going already to, to a certain very, very critical, because everybody then feels sort of accused of having a, a problem which they themselves would not want to uh, be talking about. Yeah, I agree that we, we do have quite a lot of structures also on the softer side, like RAN and others. Um, but very honestly, they weren't set up with right-wing extremism in my mind. So the experts brought together the issues that discuss the technicalities, uh, uh, which are discussed in great detail, prison radicalization, et cetera, et cetera, really, you know, in very discrete brackets, mean Islamist terrorism. That's what, what they are trying to address. Um, but uh, looking at, at CTED's work, trying to, you know, combine the existing structures um, with this new issue, um, what progress can you see? Why, well, you know, how much is really the GCTF structure or the RAND structure or other, your global research network structure, already geared towards this issue and how much way do we still have to go? Is What support would you need from member states to push this further onto the agenda of the various structures that very diligently over the last 20 years been set up? Um, yeah, that's a, another very good question. And I think off the bat, I think it's important to say that 
what we've heard from member states and international regional organizations and civil society organizations and, and other UN entities is that like that we agree that there are considerable lessons learned. I know I've mentioned this before, but <laughs> I feel like it's important to repeat and repeat. We have a lot of lessons learned from previous CT and CVE measures and PCVE measures that have been carried out against terrorism um, affiliated with ISIL and Al-Qaeda. So there's a lot to be learned there that we should not necessarily take for it. Like the, the when you compare, for example, um, other terrorist groups, extreme right wing terrorist groups are more distinct, have more distinct organizational structures and patterns of violence, right? And this includes significant roles for lone actors, as, as Simon mentioned before. So this means this really brings home the need for a, a tailored response, less, you know, kind of copy paste from previous um, CTCVE measures. And so when you're addressing the test, uh, the, the threat coming from this, um, for example, when it was ISIL and Al-Qaeda, for the longest time, um, there was no gendered perspective to this, right? So the roles of men and women were perceived as hom homogenous, or in some cases, the roles of women weren't considered at all. And so what a lot of, what we're hearing a lot is that um, we, do, we wanna make sure we're avoiding this oversight and other similar oversights when we're addressing the far right threat today. Um, I think there are lots of things that also need to be taken into consideration that come from um, previous CT and CVE measures. And one of those is the roles of FTFs, right? The foreign terrorist fighters. Um, there have been some studies published. I think in 2019, one of our GRN members, the Sufan Center published a report about um, white supremacists from North America uh, traveling to and taking part in battle alongside um, Ukrainian-based neo-Nazi groups such as the Azov Battalion. So we can't ignore the fact that FTFs are also a phenomenon in the far-right terrorism. Um, and you know, what does this mean for returnees when they're coming back? What's happening? Um, how are they influencing the society around them? There are lots of considerations to take into into this. And I feel like I could go on forever, but I feel like I should also give the floor to other uh, panelists for their expertise as well. Well, thanks so much, Farah, for this opening. I'm obviously, I shamelessly going to plug something else again. Um, we did publish also a quite a, a detailed report in 2020 on this very same issue, go, going beyond the Azov Battalion. Now, obviously, um, this ties in what, what, what uh, Mr. Hashin said at the very beginning on paramilitary training activities. The legal, um, the legal framework to address this issue is very, 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 very different if these groups, if these individuals do not join groups that are on any terrorism list. So what makes the FDF issue challenging, dangerous, but also legally speaking quite easy are Security Council resolutions, which say if you join a terrorist group in a conflict area and you travel there or you turn back, that should be declared illegal. None of the groups um, in Ukraine, either side of the front, are actually in any terrorists, not even the Russian one, um, which means <coughs> people traveling there and coming back are legally not considered foreign terrorist fighters, maybe foreign fighters, but then you come into the nitty gritty of you know, how much or how little the EU or America has actually regulated individuals going to join conflicts in other countries. So are they mercenaries? No, they haven't been paid. Are they traitors? No, they hadn't actually joined any of the uh, armies on, on either side, it was all militias. So it, it, you're ending up with a thing that these people come back and actually haven't actually committed any, any uh, um, uh, violent, uh, any committed any crime in, in in your jurisdiction, and all you can do is watch them and wait um, and wait for them to recommit on other crimes, illegal arms possession, yada yada yada. While they have the exact same um, military training that some of the foreign terrorist fighters got, and a no less radical um, ideology, uh, if you compare, you know, the affinity to violence between ISIL and some of the right wing terrorist uh, networks that they belong to. So it's a really, really tricky situation where I, I am not sure a lot of lessons from the FDF can uh, uh, work that we've done actually can be reproduced on this one, um, simply because they're just not falling into the same legal categories, at least when you're looking from the prosecutional side. On the de-radicalization side, there should definitely be some opportunities. But uh, uh, Mr. Eichen, looking at the paramilitary training activities and 
we will do have we will have well, the foreign ministry will have a, an event for international organizations later this year on this very same issue um where do you see the way forward is it more regulation is it just greater awareness what, what could a diplomat in a german embassy do to highlight that issue but also what should the german foreign ministry in your uh, opinion push for in order to get this problem a little bit further under control very difficult question i mean the i can i can if i'm the easy way out is, is just to say we have to create the awareness if i know that there's uh, uh, you know training camps uh, and i know that my colleagues in the embassy focusing on on certain topics uh, can give uh, regular reports on on the situation or if our intelligence services can gather information that is the start and if we change exchange that kind of information with other countries you know that's the first step um or maybe even going a step back since you mentioned the the also the work of the diplomats of color i think also the 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 kind of reporting and the kind of sensitivity on the political um framework uh, you know when 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 i answered the question on the radicalization process there needs to be a special lens through which i analyze the situation in the country in order to be aware that such radicalization processes can take place so that's the first step in in reporting and awareness the second one is then specific intel um and the nicest thing of course would be to to uh, have uh, uh, listings of 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 groups um but it's in the nature of the groups that it is a challenge for us to have them listed i know the us with the national listing as as easier steps there it can take the russian imperial movement has been listed uh, the uk has has listed national action another group we have uh, the association bands uh, which are of a different nature so it's not practically a terrorist group but it's the threat to our constitution um so just by looking at those information again exchanging that kind of information and linking it to increased knowledge on training activities i can already narrow down um the uh, a potential threat uh, i can narrow down trends within the country or between countries i beyond that it is it is really difficult for me right now to foresee any any concrete measure, measures such as sanction listing uh, um, from a european perspective for example super thank you so much yeah i know i agree this is still remaining a challenge and hopefully we will not see another conflict area that is as easy for right wing extremists to travel to and get training um, than we saw uh, in the ukraine conflict um, but you know it is does remain a bit of a problem um, that these individuals are now in our societies and there's literally nothing you can do until they recommit any other crime um have i i wanted to come because we are having a couple more minutes before before our time is up and i also want to encourage the participants to ah there i have a question now i just wanted to say please post more questions we only had two so far um but heather before we before i address this last question i wanted to come back to um your very end of your presentations where you actually looked at the role of russia which obviously from a german perspective is quite a relevant topic to address um where do you see the strategic thinking here from the russian side and and how would you you know construct a diplomatic counter offensive or counter measures here because i mean obviously you can go tit for tat and you can go the address aggressive route but you know at the core of the problem i don't think is a russian a russian attempt to get right wing extremists into power but to divide and weaken our society which is a far deeper strategic aim than simply favoring this candidate over the other candidate in any election would be so from your perspective where are the biggest challenges and where do we need to sharpen our diplomatic initiative to actually counter the disruption aspects of this Yeah, I, I think uh, how to address Russia and their threats are like <laughs> this huge issue, and they could get into a situation of what they're very good at is hitting so many different things that you are in a whack-a-mole situation without 
the ability to be more strategic about where you want to direct your focus. And I think that's exactly what uh, the US and other countries need to do is be more strategic about where they want to focus with on Russian activities. And so while Russia is supporting financially and paramilitary uh, uh, <laughs> uh, groups, uh, I just want to highlight that what is also strategic from the Russian perspective is it falls into a broader ideology of what they try to promote in certain aspects of their foreign policy, which is what they call traditional values, Christianity, uh, going against diversity and inclusion efforts. And so they're offering this attempt to, as an alternative to what's going on in the West about multiculturalism, about globalization, and they're seeing people who are vulnerable to uh, feeling like they don't want to be a part of that or it's uh, a detriment to society. And so they're going out and finding ways to target those individuals. And so for me, it's to mobilize, at least in the U.S., an uh, interagency approach of bringing different uh, different government agencies together to have discussion, which is always so difficult in various governments, is to share information and to have conversations and do a more uh, broader effort to say, this is where we're going to tackle the issues. Uh, with Russia generally, I think it should be part of what the U.S. government and other governments, particularly in the West, are looking at when they're addressing Russia. And I think financial flows are so important. That's something that I'm looking at is how the Russians are using cryptocurrencies. And so I think that's another aspect that needs more attention in terms of tracking the flows of money that goes around U.S. sanctions uh, and other means. So it may not just be U.S. sanctions, but it's way to avoid uh, tracking it more properly. And so that's also an area that needs to be more heavily studied. And so I think there are multiple avenues to go and it's just uh, an area that's under formation, but should be part of the broader effort of looking at Russia's malign influence within societies. All right, thanks so much, Farah. I'm gonna spare you the, the fact that you should con uh, comment on a, on a permanent security council member state, but uh, I will get back to Mr. Hashin, because as I said, he has the greatest tolerance for me getting on his nerves from all the panelists. Um, looking at all of this, and, and obviously there has been a strong push from the US side on many issues uh, for the Europeans, in particular Germany, to counter Russia more succinctly in many things that they do. Um, where is the German strategy heading towards Russia? I, I'm not saying anything about pipelines, but is there a, is there a concerned effort to take a more somber approach? especially when it comes to the attempts of Russia to support groups also inside Germany that belong to the broader spectrum? Or where do you think the strategy is going to go? This is very difficult for me to comment. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not the Russia expert and we're currently in coalition negotiations. So the Russia discussion is in flux. I can say what, what, what we saw during the last years. I mean, you, you know, I've, I've been posted at NATO as I mentioned in the beginning. Um, so uh, um, there has been clear messages uh, towards uh, Russia when it came to just recently when we talk about the Navalny case, but also uh, with regard uh, to the situation in Ukraine and we're part of the Normandy format. Um, so we have been very clear in, in our messaging, um, but we'll continue uh, with the dual track approach. As, as stated in NATO since 1967 at the Harmel Report, which is, yes, uh, uh, deterrence, but at the same time, dialogue. And I can tell you from my experience in the terrorism uh, realm, um, we continue to have uh, discussions on counterterrorism with Russia, of course, because we have to stay in contact. We have to understand what they're doing. At the same time, we very clearly message them what is acceptable and what is not. And we did not have such cases as uh, the, the financing of the Front National in France. Um, and we did not have similar cases. But we had uh, uh, disinformation attacks against our battalion of the enhanced forward presence in Lithuania. And we had the case of the young girl missing in Berlin, which was abused by Russian disinformation campaigns up to the foreign minister. And we made very clear what we think of those kind of attempts of uh, trying to uh, manipulate internal procedures. And the same happened before 
the German general elections when we communicated very clearly what we know about cyber activities and what not. And the recent designation in the cyber sanctions regime in Brussels, which were the first ones uh, very clearly in, in saying where the attacks came from and how we communicated on the national and a European level also speak a very clear role. But again, it's a dual track. Uh, um, we'll, we'll have to continue to stay in dialogue and communicate. On the and, and for me, it's going to be very important to get the, 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 the Russian perspective on, on uh, CT developments or terrorist developments and extremist developments in Central Asia and Afghanistan. So I, I will have to have that kind of communication and exchange of view. Uh, but the overall um, overall strategy or, or whatever is something I, I, I can't really comment. On. That's why I was all looking backwards in, in my comments, sort of recapturing how we reacted. And I think most of it will stay very much the same. Thank you so much. Um, just for the benefit of those who are not German, the story of the missing girl is actually a totally made up story that surfaced on, on, uh, surface on social media, perpetrated by Russian trolls that made up a story of a, of a girl being missing in Germany and actually by, by man manipulating social media, got quite sizable demonstration grounds uh, 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 crowds on German and Berlin streets demonstrating for you know finding this girl which actually never existed. So it was a you know really good e example of manipulating public opinion with actual real life consequences. It didn't really influence the election results at that point in the way that it possibly was intended, but it was quite uh, um, impressive to see what what you can do by a pure invented online perpetrated story without really any basis in reality whatsoever. So I wasn't even exaggerating the incident. Uh, you, everyone stated that there's a, a lack of definition, the right-wing extremism, especially when crossing borders. Um, but international legislation, here it says it mentions right-wing extremism or terrorism in, in, in addition to Islamist terrorism, actually, international legislation doesn't mention any ideologies, just says terrorism. Um, what is the problem of having differentiated approaches, i.e. a, the, the, the listener asks, uh, i.e. right-wing uh, legislation focusing on right-wing extremism or terrorism and then parallel legislation for, focused on Islamist terrorism? What was the experience in the past of having non-tailored approaches, I guess is the question. Um. If you take into consideration previous uh, mentions of terrorism in various Security Council resolutions, it always refers to terrorism in all of it, all its forms and manifestations. However, when we would discuss issues of extreme right wing violence um, with member states, the issue of terror, the, the word terrorism didn't necessarily come up. Um, and I think with time, as we saw with the, the um, trends alerts, then the Security Council became more comfortable as the, the trend, um, as the issues developed a bit more. Um, there was, a, in a sense, we, we could say it was a bit of a bias towards a specific kind of terrorism, right? So even though we said terrorism in all of its forms and manifestations without being a bit more explicit, it becomes tricky um, and it sometimes blur uh, is faded into the background. So people won't necessarily consider um, ex white supremacy a terrorist attack. Um, whereas now we are seeing it's becoming more transnational. It is a threat to international peace and security. And the fact that it hasn't been addressed adequately uh, leads us to believe that there is a need to bring this uh, spell it out a bit more explicitly. So even though it is a long phrase, um, terrorism on the basis of xenophobia, racism, and other forms of intolerance, and in the name of uh, religion or belief, it kind of it attempts to bring attention the fact that there are other forms of terrorism that we need to consider when we are addressing terrorism, and that it is not all um, terrorism emanating from groups such as ISIL and Qaeda. And I say, I often use this phrase because um, also at the UN, we try not to use the word jihadist or Islamist terrorism because we do not associate these terrorist groups with actual uh, religion or religious groups. 
So uh, that's why I often say uh, ISIL and Qaeda because also they are listed uh, terrorist organizations at the UN. So uh, not spelling it out is what maybe um, meant that there was a lack of attention to the issue. And the fact that it is, it has over the last several years become more international um, in CFT, in, uh, sorry, in countering the financing of terrorism, in um, spreading propaganda, in recruitment, in radicalization across the world means that it is actually a threat to international peace and security and needs to be addressed properly by member states. And so I think that spelling out was, was needed. Superb, thank you. That also answered my, my question of how you're gonna, you know, label the other terrorism that everyone has become so comfortable in, in uh, labeling Islamist terrorism. All right, um, I, Dr. Maya, there is a, a question actually to you and it's rather complex. So let me try to unpack that a little bit. Um, you in your initial statement had mentioned the importance of ideology for the violence and how ideology influences the way that violence and how and when violence is perpetrated and how this may also influence those actors in the institution. The, the participant would like to know um, if on the construction of countermeasures, you see influence of race or ideological or religious background of society. So if we would say, for example, that Europe is a society or Germany is a country that is to a certain extent influenced by Christian values, um, does that have any influence on the constructions of those countermeasures in a good or in a bad way, in a helpful or in an unhelpful way? Short answer, absolutely. Um, longer answer. Um, I think when you're sort of, sort of going back to the point that I made earlier, when you're thinking about ideologies that are connected, however loosely, to how we think about ordering groups in society, then how we're taught as people within that society, whether we are policymakers or researchers um, or diplomats, um, how society should be ordered and that influences our views on what is actually thinkable as a policy solution. Um, the, the participant mentioned culture, religion, I think race is the obvious big uh, identity group here that really matters when we're talking about far right and white supremacist violence. Um, in my own work, this is difficult to parse out because in the German context, uh, the federal bureaucracy, while not entirely white, is overwhelmingly white, um, even more so than in the United States where the numbers are also not good uh, in terms of diversity. Uh, the few uh, policymakers and uh, bureaucrats of color whom I've been able to speak with in the US context have vastly different perspectives on this uh, than the white, uh, they're white colleagues. That may be because I myself am white uh, and am the person in, in what people are willing to tell me varies based on my own position here. Um, but the way that in my limited experience, people of color working in these industries and in the government talk about responses to white supremacist violence uh, is very different and much and implicates much more strongly existing state institutions, whether those are law enforcement, security or um, particular political parties than white bureaucrats. And so I think when we're thinking about how do we respond effectively to the threat of white supremacist violence into particular groups, um, the, not only are the people making these policies, might they be biased in certain ways by their own political views or their own experiences, but simply by being raised and socialized as white or not white in these white majority countries, uh, you're going to get particular perspectives and particular things that are imaginable and thinkable um, to people that are perhaps constrained in ways that would not be constrained for somebody from a different racial, cultural, religious background. Well, thank you. That's a very interesting point. So would be the threat perception also be influenced by this? I.e., does it seem less dangerous? I hesitate to say less dangerous. I think I would frame it slightly uh, as recognizing that there is a danger in white supremacist violence, but having difficulty imagining alternative policy prescriptions in response to it. I'll give you an example. Um, so in my work with German bureaucrats and staffers, I was initially quite surprised to find that a number of them identified quite strongly that white supremacist violence in Germany is an enormous problem and the state needs to do more in their view to respond to it, um, 
and that past efforts, especially um, in response to the NSU measures of the early 2000s, um, increases in personnel, increases in financial resources, uh, were not sufficient to address those problems. Um, and so then I asked them, okay, well, what would, what would be sufficient in your mind? Um, what should we do? Uh, and they said, well, we should provide more personnel and more money, more of the same policy solutions that they just told me hadn't worked. Uh, and so squaring that circle becomes quite difficult if one could simply say, well, bureaucrats are always going to like advocate for more resources for their own agencies and reasonably understandably so. No criticism there. Um, I don't think that's a race issue. I think that is just, that's the way you yes. work issue. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, at the same time, um, when you're thinking about um, perhaps alternative policy solutions um, to, if past solutions haven't worked, what, and this genuine desire to make something work in the future, um, what do we do? Um, the ability to, or, or perhaps the unwillingness or difficulty in coming up with alternative solutions that don't work through established pathways, whether that is simply throwing money at security institutions or doing investigations to particular branches of the military and such things that haven't worked in the past. Um, I think there's a real need to move out of those spaces into more whole of society, traditional justice types of approaches. And those are very difficult things to think about because they implicate white people of being part of the problem. Uh, and so it's <laughs> like that, that's an uncomfortable thing. Uh, and it's not surprising to me um, that a white person, whether off the street or in a government office, has difficulty voicing that and being willing to do that. There's no incentive to do that, even if you view white supremacy as a problem. So. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, it's very interesting. I mean, I, I said at one of the events in the past, you know, if we get used to the fact that terrorists have begun to look like us again, right, we would be much further ahead than we are right now. <laughs> because really, ironically, in the 60s and 70s, Europe was very much used to terrorists looking like us. Uh, you had anarchists, you had the Red Army faction, you had a whole uh, Irish Republican army being very active. So obviously, if you said terrorism in the 1970s, the initial thought would have been a guy who looks like me and called Thomas Meyer or, you know, Müller Westerhagen or something like that. But, uh, you know, now we've actually unlearned uh, and, and construct the other uh, as far as terrorism really, uh, you know, primarily on, on a different religious belief, you know, in brackets and skin color. So it's quite interesting to, to that societies have to relearn the constructions of the other as the terrorist that looks like my neighbor or, or my dad or my brother. Um, Heather, on, on, your, on your side, you do obviously have a great division here and, and a discussion on race uh, in really brought to a head by the Obama administration, which at the same time was a great promise and a great, you know, to a certain extent, disappointment on, on that issue. Uh, under Biden, who tries to steady the ship on this question, do you see any greater, deeper discussion on this issue as far as uh, if you look at the counterterrorism, uh, the domestic uh, terrorism strategy, race doesn't really feature very deeply in that strategic document. Um, where do you see the, the Biden administration going forward on this issue or not forward at all? Yeah, I think one of the challenges is that the we're placing so much on putting people in diverse positions that they need to work beyond that in terms of the policy implications. And so while there has been some discussion about that and addressing like for instance, with the Federal Emergency Management Agency, how do you address marginalized communities that are hit by disasters in different ways? I think it has a long way to go in terms of you have to unravel how institutionalized things are within the government and uh, organizations that the government may join with. And so I think, unfortunately, it's not something that they could take that could take place in the four years that Biden's in power. You're talking about something that's more long term. And the other challenge is the way that appropriations take place for government in uh, the US system is that you're always on a system of continuing resolutions. So there's never a budget to help agencies plan out longer than a year or two about what they're going to do and what they try to achieve. And if they do, they're in this constant struggle of someone in Congress not liking what a program is and putting that into law that you can't use funds for this particular effort. And so I think 
the Biden administration is just going to have a struggle that's been going on for decades for different types of administrations in the U.S. system of building a more equitable and fair society that extends beyond the rhetoric. Fantastic. All right. So the challenges remain and the bureaucratic uh, cycles are really not conducive to getting ahead on those challenges. That's quite a sobering, sobering message here. I wasn't even aware of the uh, you know, that kind of tight budget, uh, budgetary planning in, in the US. Thank you for that one. Um, Farah, there is a, one last question before we close off that I think is tailor-made for, for CTED. Um, as I know that CTED and UNOCT has been working quite diligently on the issue of victims of terrorism and, you know, highlighting um, victims of terrorism, uh, getting capacity building on bringing this issue. And the one of the participants really clearly highlighted, yes, we, we did focus nearly 90 minutes now on the guys who do the violence, and we really haven't mentioned anyone who's uh, at the receiving end of this. Um, as you moved along with this issue on, on the Security Council side, um, will this also be part of the whole programs that UNOCT and CTED is running on, on victim support, capacity building, awareness raising? Yeah, um, absolutely, and I think this is, uh at least uh, definitely within my team that we have these discussions regularly, what about the victims, what about the victims on both sides or on all sides of terrorism, but also when we're discussing extreme right wing, right? Um, because again, it's, there's this affiliation of it's happening in mainly Western rich countries that they can handle it, they can take care of these issues. Uh, but the reality is that there needs to be more civil there there are civil society organizations working on this and there needs to be more support for those organizations that are helping victims um and actually it, last year it's very difficult there you know after sorry after 2020 everything is not clear time-wise but i believe it was last year in october um and i believe it was the german presidency where we had a, a ctc open briefing where we discussed extreme right-wing terrorism um and we kicked off the entire conversation. Um, we were hoping they could join live, but unfortunately they couldn't, but it was a Christchurch um, organization that was basically briefing us about um, their work on victims. Initially, we had planned for um, a victim to come and, and, and give their testimony, but of course, we respected the fact that when they decided they weren't comfortable with this, um, that we would be fine with the organization telling us about their work. So we do try to bring um, the focus back to the victim because um, I think one of the, the interesting questions, I think I'm just gonna pull it up that was mentioned uh, for this meeting was, why has there so far uh, not been adequate response by national and international in institutions to the threat of far right extremism. And I think one of the things when I saw that I wanted to flip the question on its head is, well, with this in mind, has there actually been any adequate or has there been adequate response to the threat of terrorism more broadly? Um, we have been spending billions of dollars um, on the, the in this fight against terrorism with few tangible results. So I think there might may need to be a bit more focus, not just on uh, counterterrorism, but also countering violent extremism and preventing it, in addition to a substantial support to uh, victims of terrorism. And I believe UNOCT is working heavily on this as well. Um, and CTED uh, continuously tries to promote um, victims as um, a, 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 a tar as a group that should always be at the front of any of our efforts in, in CT and CBE. Superb. On this very positive summary of 20 years of counterterrorism work, um, I, I think we have to close, slowly come to a close. And I, I wanted to hand over again to Ms. Sauter for her closing remarks from uh, Junge DGAP, if she's still online. I actually am. I didn't think I would come back on, but thank you for uh, closing the session uh, right on time. Thank you all for uh, having been our panelists and uh, we really enjoyed the discussion and this video will be put online on YouTube and um, thank you once again for taking the time today. Have a good evening. Bye.